Praise the Lord. From whom all blessings flow. Would like to talk to you this morning or this afternoon. It is now 1.16 Central Time. Talk to you about the church. Are you in the church? Or are you out of the church? Hey, sis, how are you doing? Macy, how are you? John, brother, how are you? God bless you. It's good to hear from you. I know where you're from, but tell us where you joined from. Can you say amen? So nice to see you all. I have a word that I want to share with you. And it starts when I was a boy. I, uh, when I was born, I was born in A-Row in the project of the higher day. Then I was taken to the hospital. Uh, you know, back then we had doctors who actually made house calls. Can you hear me okay? Anyhow, uh, I grew up uh, out there in the projects and uh, the icon picture you see up above there is myself, Jimmy and Dean, and we were neighbors. Amen, God bless you, John. And so, uh, my granddad, my father's dad, uh, John and I's granddad, I should say, uh, he used to tell mom and dad, he said, you know, James, you need to get them kids into the church. Now, being he was a preacher, he used to take us to Shippensburg, Saito, a uh, couple times. And then and, and, uh, at one time, he took us to a, a Amish house. And in this Amish house, we, there was uh, uh, farmers, and they had a couple little kids. Back then, they used uh, kerosene lanterns. Boy, am I old. Today, it's 75. Uh, anyhow, uh, these kids took Cordella and I out to the uh, barn, and there was a big wagon full of grain. And they asked uh, Cordella and I, said, do you guys chew gum? And we said, yeah, we like chewing gum. And so uh, they said, take this grain and start chewing on it. They said, it tastes like beech nut chewing gum. And so we did. Anyhow, uh, we went there and we had a big old meal and all these lanterns on the dining room table. And uh, we just had a very good time. But I said that to say this, that granddad took us with him wherever he went. Uh, but sometimes we wouldn't get home until late evening. And uh, so he wanted us in Sunday school. And so the very first Sunday school we went to uh, was the Church of God in Christ. I was uh, probably five years old at that time. And they gave us like a little pamphlet, something, something like this one here, you know. It had a picture of Jesus on the back, on the front, holding sheep and stuff like that. And uh, so he, uh, 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 I got that little paper and I ran home, uh, went upstairs in the second floor and jumped up on the cedar chest and started talking. Thank you. God bless you. And I started talking and uh, uh, to Jesus and I put that paper up on the window. I said, Jesus, are you out there? And what's interesting about this is uh, he would answer me. And there was a time that we had in the project, they had a utility room off the kitchen. And in the living room, they had a closet sort of up under the concrete steps. And inside that closet was where we stored our winter stuff, our summer stuff, vice versa. And it was where my dad had an old guitar in there with about four strings on it. And when I would meet with the Lord, it would be in that closet. 
around, I was about five years old then, and I would be in that closet with him from time to time over the next five years. And we began to, uh, my mom and dad got their first house, and uh, I think they paid $6,000 for it up on uh, Fulton and Dolphin, and uh, we moved up there. But during the course of time that I was meeting with the Lord in that closet, he, pre, he, he predestinated me there. You know, in other words, he ordained me to be a pastor, even right there at that time. But as time progressed, I had a lot of visions, and, and visions were what I had all the time, and dreams. But the one, last time, pretty much, I had a couple of smaller dreams since then recently. But the last time I had a big dream where I cried out to Jesus, he snatched me out of that dream so fast that uh, I didn't even realize that he had done it, you know, uh, faster than you can blink an eye. And so the dreams began to fade off, you know, uh, but the visions really got greater, you know. And throughout the, you know, growing up and in my youth, in my ch child years, I would shake my head, you know, when I had these visions. And then it would be stuff that would relate to me later on. And then in the, in the teenage years, I would have these visions and I would slap myself upside the head. Well, I don't do that no more. But over the my adult years, I began to learn and more and more and understand these visions and these, these sometimes dreams. So, you know, uh, they would occur so fast, some of them. And even the last ones I've gotten, well, let me continue on with my story. So uh, I uh, left Pennsylvania, uh, the East Coast, back. Uh, uh, well, I come out of the bar in 75. I had a seafood house on the same street the bar was on, on Marcus Street. And uh, I come out of the bar and I began to uh, call out to God at three o'clock in the morning. I looked up, and that's why I tell my little sis that three o'clock in the morning is the time to pray. But anyhow, I come out there and I yelled out to God, and the stars were out, the moon was out, and the sky was blue. And I said, Lord, is it always going to be this way? And little did I know. Uh, Three years later, I would get married to my second wife, be ordained into a ministry, a missions ministry. And I would also have that vision, one of the last visions that where the Lord told me, he said, they're going to move from the East Coast to the Midwest. And from the Midwest, I mean, from the West Coast to the Midwest and from the East Coast to the Midwest. In other words, the coast, we're going to have some issues. And over, over the years when I came, I, I wound up in Colorado and I began to uh, drive truck. And as I drove, I used, used to drive for a lot of temporary help companies like Manpower and stuff like that. And... I got stuck on a railroad track with a one-ton stake body truck. Now, this railroad track didn't have no crossbars. It just had a stop sign there. Well, it had snowed, and I pulled up to the track, and my tires went into a, a hole where there was ice and snow. The train was coming as I sat there and trying to get out of the hole. It was blowing its horn. And lo and behold, you know, the angel of the Lord pushed me through. Now, what I need to let you know today is God loves you. He loves you more than any other thing he has ever created. And that's why he made you a part of him. But anyhow, in my lifetime, I'm going to try and get ahead here a little bit. In 1978, when we got to Colorado, I was working for these temporary places. I got a sheet here. I tried to put this all out, you know, but I'm not even on this sheet to keep track of it. Because everything that I've experienced in my walk with the 
with the Lord and in my life with the Lord has dates and time. But anyhow, uh, I got another job and it was driving trucks for interstate batteries and I hauled uh, stuff, uh, batteries up into Utah and uh, Wyoming and down into uh, the state of Mexico. Now, the ones in Utah and Wyoming, they went into the coal mine carts, you know, that bring the coal up out of the mine. Anyhow, uh, I come through Wyoming across the Lincoln Monument uh, Mount. And I was heading east, coming back east, head, heading towards Nebraska. And the cloud had set down on the mountain. And lo and behold, I thought the Lord had come to get me. Nevertheless, I would continue that route for probably six months. It was a three-day route, which I did in two days. But when I was off the rest of the time, I delivered handover shoes that we unloaded in a warehouse uh, in Colorado. And uh, so I would leave one job to do the other, vice versa. And both of them kept me like uh, part time. So I would put the first, I decided I wanted to put an altar. I'm big on high places and praying, and I'm big on having altars, which I have right here. Uh, I also have one that will be 30 years old next year. Can you see that? I don't know if you can see that. And anyhow, uh, I would plant, uh, one, on one of my trips, I would be up in that Lincoln Monument uh, Mountain in the high place, and I would designate a tower. I called it a prayer tower back then. And that one was my north tower. As I continued that route, uh, I would put another one in the state of New Mexico on I-25, and it was in a high mountain. The mountain was really uh, one where a state cop used to, you know, be up and down that mountain, uh, visiting with the truckers on their CVs and different stuff. Uh, so, but anyhow, I, uh, I quit that job and started a tow business. Actually, I went to a junkyard to start working there first. And then I had bought a tow truck while I was working there. And I began to tow vehicles off the road and at one point, you know, and the Lord blessed me in every business I had, and I had 12 different business. But, you know, I was weak in the mind. You know, I had a drinking problem, and the enemy, even after I got in the ministry for nine years, he stayed after me there. But God is good, and he is able. And all you have to do is give it all your heart. You may want to know why I'm wearing this. It's a kippah. And I, I've had one in, the, in there with my uh, talif, uh probably 30 years now. But I just decided the kippah is a recognition of God. In other words, we, we acknowledge that God is our higher authority. I'm telling, telling you so many things at one time. Uh, but anyhow, uh, when I planted the South Tower, that was the last tower, and I planted that in, in 1979, and I still had two towers to plant. But I come off the road with the tow business, and I did not go back on the road until 1987. And in 87, I closed the tow business. And one of the first things I did is start driving tractor trailer again. And the Lord said to me, uh, uh, you owe me some towers. He more or less just reminded me. I said, yes, Lord. You, know, you always say yes to the Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Oh, how I love him. Bless his holy name. Anyhow, I uh, started hauling coarse beer. 
out of Golden, Colorado, and I had that was uh, in 1987. And I would haul, of course, beer out to McAllen down there where Trump was recently at the border because, and I would bring produce back. And there were ten, tens of thousands of trucks that would go down there and bring produce back. Maybe you don't all know, but produce comes from three places. It comes from California, it comes from across the border down in McAllen, Texas, and in that area, and it comes from Florida. And those are seasonal times that the produce come out. So as I began to run again, I had a trip to California. And the Lord, like I said, reminded me I needed another tower. And these are high places. When I think of the Lord, I think of high places. And so I went on and uh, went out to California this one trip. And I was going up Donner Pass. Now, Donner Pass is so high. It's one of the only places that it really snows in California. And there must have been a trucker that lost his life on the, going down that mountain. As a matter of fact, at the very top, they tell you to pull over and adjust your brakes before starting down. So anyhow, I uh, got to the top there and planted my prayer tower or altar, however you want to call it. So then when I did that, I would end up going, at that time, Coors was having their beer back in Virginia, and they had started selling it back there because they didn't have spring water back there. And so the beer had to be taken back there, and then I would bring regular freight back to the Midwest here uh, in Colorado. But God is good. In my lifetime, you know, he has uh, intervened on my behalf, a thousand times. His angels have intervened to keep me more than two dozen times. We need God in our life. You see, the, there's been a great falling away from the church, hundreds of thousands of people, uh, hundreds, hundreds of millions of people, I should say. Uh, have fallen away from the Lord. And I am here because that vision that God gave me when I would leave the East Coast, I had a new wife, a new ministry, and that vision. And the vision was they would move from the East Coast to the Midwest, from the West Coast to the Midwest. And when Kim Jong un after 42 years, I've waited to develop this vision. Said that he had missiles that would eat, reach our East Coast and our West Coast. That triggered that vision. And it triggered my whole being pretty much. And then we used to record our church services at Spectrum, which is Time Warner. Uh, we did it, it started, this last church we started was in 2016. And then we uh, closed that one because of the, my, my uh, Kansas church. Uh, there was some paperwork file up. And so I started this new one, The Way of God Through Jesus Christ Church Ministry. And when I did that, uh, we were recording down at the studios, like I said, and, because we hadn't had a building. And we began to record in January, uh, January of 2017, about the third or fourth week, because that's when we record once a month down there. Uh, I began to have dry heaves. In other words, if you cry so much, you begin to... <laughs> <laughs> trying to catch your breath and go on and cry. And I call them dry weeping. In the war that's coming in 2030, which I should have mentioned, there is a war coming. World War III as well as World War IV. And Trump wants to be the dictator of this country. And there are six other, there are five other dictators to 
be, make the six. There are six men, six countries, and six nations of people. And in that, the Lord had told me, this is what he told me. He said, there is going to be a billion people die in this wartime. You see, somebody's going to flip a button, and a missile's going to go, and everybody else is going to want to join and say, well, we got this. We'll help you here, this and that. But my relatives, my friends, we need the Lord to intervene. I hope that this weeping that I do all the time, maybe 12 times a day, it even catches me off guard sometimes. You know. But in World War II, 80 million people died. And I was sharing with someone the other day when, when I was a boy how uh, uh, the Jews that I knew from the East Coast all had numbers on their arms. These are the older, elder Jews. The Jews were the first one to give me any authority, any power. The Jews were the first one to teach me math when I was 10 years old. They teach me how to count it in my head. Mr. Bear over around uh, Fulton and Kelker Street, he taught me. God has watched over me. He's put me in very special places. I would have four heart attacks starting in uh, July 16th, 1988 was my very first heart attack. I had come in from over the road and uh, was living here in Lincoln back then. And it was a Friday night I came in and, and uh, had four hot dogs before I went to sleep. I got up six o'clock Saturday morning and I uh, went to the bathroom. And by, when I returned to the bed, I couldn't breathe. And I fell down on one of my knees and I said, Lord, help me. And Betty, she had called the ambulance. And they were there pretty fast. And so they came and gave me a nitro. And then they realized that uh, when they took me in the hospital, the, the, the male nurse was going to give me another one. And it about took me out of this world. So then he poured this red alcohol on me, and he began to clean it all off of me. And uh, so I, my blood pressure and everything began to get back to normal. But while I was in this bedroom and uh, waiting on the uh, EMTs to take me out, I'm jumping back and forth. I, I sometimes get too much in my head uh, uh, because everything is in there by dates, and sometimes the enemy wants to defeat me. But I'm at war with him, so he... he he knows not. He's not allowed in my house, nor my church, nor any any near where, where my presence is. But anyhow, the when I when when they brought me out, these three big guys, they couldn't get the gurney back in the back in the bedroom, and so when they brought picked me up and they lifted me towards heaven and they brought me out, the Lord said to me, He gave me another name, and He said, from this day forth, this will be who you are. Now, when you're in God's hands, you don't have to worry about being healed. He, he created you. So he can heal you anytime you ask him to with a pure heart. This is what turns the Lord, a pure heart. You must have a pure heart because God is good. So they took me on down, and that was the first first heart attack I had, and that was July 16, 1988. Second heart attack what I, that I would have was I had bought a brand new house, and, and we were living in that house. Oh, I didn't tell you about the accident. I removed the pastor from his church, 
And I didn't know what I was there for. I went there in 93. And in 95, the Lord told me what he wanted me to do. And I do what God tells me to do. I don't do nothing that I want to do. Now, I can have anything I want. I can buy myself anything I want. But I want him more than I want anything else. Because I have a special place with him. Uh, anyhow, see, I get in, get too far ahead. I got off. Didn't even go near my list. But God is so good. And so after my second heart attack came after my uh, first divorce to my ex-wife, uh, and then uh, that was uh, the first first heart attack was the angioplasty where they take a balloon and push the uh, cholesterol up against the arteries. The second heart attack was in April 2002, uh, during the time I had applied for my divorce and everything with my, my ex-wife, one of my ex-wives. And during that same time, I was starting to build another church. I had a preacher, I had went to the hospital to visit, and I talked with him, I prayed with him, I told him what I did build churches. And I asked him, I said, well, how long are you going to be in this, this hospital? He said, oh, another two weeks at least. And, uh, you know, I talked to him for three hours, prayed with him. And he left that hospital that day. And he went on to Colorado from, from here in Lincoln to visit his family. When he came back, he would come to me at my apartment and uh, ask me to help him build a church. So I did. He's one of my spiritual sons, I call him. Uh, we work well together. Uh, over the last 42 years, that's what I've done, built churches. And I had to close up three. And there's no fun in closing up, up any church for any reason. But God is good. So then I had my third heart attack. That was in the first, the second was in April. And the third one, April, May, June, July, August, was in August of 2002, same year. And they looked in there and they, they, they said, the stents that we put in your heart, I had actually five block of blockages, but they only put three stents in back in April. But then in August, I, those stents blocked up. And this is good. This is good. So those stents blocked up and uh, they said, we're going to have to do a triple bypass on you. So they did the triple bypass, and the next year, uh, it was 2004, so it must have been two years, 2004, I go back into the hospital complaining, thinking I'm going to have a quadruple bypass then. And there's two surgeons there, and the one surgeon said, after they had shot the dye in my groin and it went throughout my arteries and stuff where they could see the blockages, the one surgeon said to the other, he says, uh, have you ever seen this before? And he said, I've seen it one other time. When God sends you to a surgeon that allows you to go to a surgeon, he's interested in them to do things a certain way. But evidently, they didn't do it the way he wanted it. And so what he done, I just love you, Lord, is he opened those block arteries that the surgeons couldn't unblock. So they gave me this triple bypass, cut me down here wrapping me up like uh, a tie on a chicken or something. So he had shriveled up the artery. Normally they take the arteries out of your leg, but they took mine out of up here. 
And so God opened up the arteries and the, uh, the, the veins that they had attached to my heart from up here had shriveled up. And that's what was causing me the heart pain, the transition of those. And then, uh, so I did have a total of four heart attacks. I just left out one. The next thing I had in 2017, and I'm still doing these dry heaps, crying for people who are not dead yet, weeping for a million people. Like I said, that's 13 times more than the 80 million that died in World War II. So on July, uh, June, June 5th, my wife and I, and my new wife and I, Linda, had went to the dentist. Uh, we were getting our teeth checked and everything, and getting old, you know, I have some figures in my mind. And, uh, but God is still good. No matter what I go through, he takes me through. So I know he's still good. So we come home from the dentist that day and we stopped by the apartment here to get lunch. And she was saying to me, uh, I was sitting here like I am now at another desk, but everything was still here in this position. And she said to me, uh, I'm going to call Bob and tell him I'm coming down. And I turned to her, and she was like over here sitting on a chair or something. And I said to her, who's Bob? And she says to me, she says, uh, you know, that's my brother. I said, I don't know no Bob. And so she just says, I'm going to call him back. She said, tell him I ain't coming. <laughs> And so I assumed that she wasn't going. And so she said, uh, is there some, there's something wrong with you? And when she said that, I said, oh, well, she said, I want to take you to the hospital. And I said, uh, well, let me get my slippers on. Because, I, you know, I don't want to go to a hospital where my shoes have to put them on every time. So I took my slippers. And I went in her bedroom and uh, laid on the bed. She said, now you're going to have to get up. I'm going to have to take you to the hospital. She had realized that I, my mind had crashed. And when I get to the hospital, they uh, take me here of a whole room of people and put me in, uh, in their uh, place where they check you out first uh, in the back there with these nurses. And, and the nurse said, Mr. Anderson? I said, what's wrong with you? And I said to uh, the nurse, I said, I don't know. I pointed at my wife. I said, you asked her. She's the one brought me here. Lo and behold, they take pictures of my brain and there's some issues in my brain. And I don't see these till almost a day later. They kept asking me my name. I, I don't know. You know. How old are you? I asked her. I don't know. That was on a Monday. Tuesday, they start giving me all this different stuff. They did on Monday, too, but they were running me around to give me all those tests. And, uh, all night long, Tuesday, the nurses wouldn't let me sleep. Mr. Anderson, how old are you? This and that. All, what year were you born? This and that. You know, stuff you should naturally know. Then in the wee hours coming into Wednesday morning, I guess God showed up. Because when they began to ask me, who am I? <laughs> I began to tell them, but I wasn't too concerned for some reason. I know who I am, and I know whose I am. I am a man under authority, and I am a man with authority. 
in the kingdom of God. And so we went for another day. I stayed there through Wednesday. And by Wednesday, I was popping. I was taking showers and getting ready to get out of that hospital. And by now, two of my daughters are here. One from North Carolina, one from my church in Kansas, and their husbands. And when they came, uh, my older daughter, she said, uh, I want to see if this stroke affected that. So within three days of being discharged at the hospital, I went to one of my Church of God in Christ churches, which I came to when uh, I first moved here. And when she heard me get in the pulpit and tell about my stroke, she was saying, this stroke didn't weaken my dad. It just made him strong. God will make you strong. Scripture clearly says that we need to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy mind. Heart, mind, body, and soul. And we should love our neighbor as ourselves. One of the things that God showed me last year as I was visiting my last living mentor in the hospital. Uh, I had went to visit him. Actually, I had went to take a modem back to Spectrum, Time Warner, and I didn't have it with me. Didn't know I had to bring it with me. And that was on like a, a Monday or Tuesday. And uh, I said, well, I'll bring it back tomorrow. I'll show you how God works. God can put you any place, any time. He can put you in up with people of authority. He can raise you up high. He can do anything. But anyhow, uh, I went back the next day with the modem in my hand. And in walks my mentor's son. And uh, he has a modem in his hand in return. And, and he travels making speeches throughout the United States. And uh, so he uh, said, wait a minute. He said, I'll be over there in a minute. So he turned his modem in and he come over to me and he said, uh, would you pray for my dad? Now him and his dad, my, his dad and I are like that, you know, and he is also from the Pennsylvania. I said, I'll do more than that. I said, go oh, where he's at. Where is he at? And he named the hospital. And I said, okay. I went right up there after turning in my motive. And I began to visit with this mentor of mine, this pastor of mine, whom I love. And I began to see he had the day before I had stents put in to his legs, his one leg, the same one that he would later have uh, surgery on that day. And he, I had seen it when the nurse come and look at it and unwrapped it and everything. And, but I was there to encourage him, to lift him up. Because even though he was a born again believer and a pastor for 40 some years, the flesh is weak. And so he says, uh, uh, he call, calls his son and he tells his son that his operation uh, time has been changed. And the son says, Dad, I, I just can't get there. And when he got off the phone, I said to him, Pastor, I'm going to be here till it's all over with. And I continued to pray with him and tell him about the old times that him and I had because I was with him for six years. 
And then uh, uh, I began to witness to him the whole time, and he would begin to laugh, you know. And uh, he said, uh, "This is this is good, you know." The testimony. He enjoyed the testimony because we need to encourage one another to be strong in our walk with God. So then they took him down, and I went down with him to the surgery. And I sat in a special place, and I represented his family. And when they said, I'll call you when he, he comes out of surgery. So uh, the doctor comes to meet with me, and he talks to me about his procedure and what he'd done and saying he's going to be just fine now. And uh, he, he, his toe had failed and began to, it was purple and it had to be removed. I was so excited. And as the doctor finished talking to me, I went up to the room and he was already there. And the nurses was putting him down in his bed and everything. And he, he looked at me. And he did this. He said to me, Brother, I told them you were all right. Now, I was with him for six years, but I've known him for over 20. So he would get discharged. And actually, the day he got discharged, his son came in that evening. But the next day he got discharged, and they came and took him home. He was so heavy on my heart before I left the hospital that day. I was excited. And I told him, I said, I can't wait until I can get to my church. I said, God is so good. And I was hurrying to get to my church. And I was left the parking garage. And I got to the exit. And the love of God comes so overwhelmingly over me. I just broke down and said, Lord, you know I love you. God is good. At the end of... Uh, 2017, I had some uh, colon issues. Both my mom and dad died from some form of colon cancer. I believe that's right, isn't it, sisters? And so I was walking around the house here <laughs> and God began to do colon surgery on me 
And over the next few hours, he completed that surgery. I actually took pictures of the situation in the toilet as it progressed. So if man can't do it right, we know God can. And I love you. Just like you who are the body of Christ, I love you. After God had anointed me, after I had left my pastor, every time I would be in the grocery store or Walmart or wherever I would be, people would see this hat on my head. And they would say, I'd say the hat says God is good all the time. And they would walk up to me and say, I like your hat. Scripture says, in all thy ways, acknowledge him. This is just the way. Wearing this, my mother brought me one of the first crosses I had from a jewelry store before I went into the ring for it. Nobody could take it off but me or her. <laughs> Yeah, I probably didn't tell you about being in the Marine Corps. I was able off for a year. Back in the 60s. I loved alcohol. But now I love Jesus. That's how it worked. I was in that. God had never left me alone, not ever. When I went to the, the I was in training, then I ended up going to the hospital to have cellulose ganglion membrane removed from my ankle on the right ankle. And uh, there we had to stand at attention in every ward on the, in the hospital, and someone was in charge. God don't care who you are. If he loves you enough and you love him enough, He'll position you anywhere in, 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 in any society. And so I was there. But before I went to the hospital, I had I was in screening for two weeks. Then I go to general population. And while I was in the hospital, I took care of a young man who uh, was being abused by one of the other guys. And I stood up for him, and uh, he told me, he said, I got an older brother in the Marine Corps. Now, I'm telling you about God. He said, uh, when, I, when I turned myself in and everything, and was taken back to Paris Island, South Carolina, uh, I get in there, and uh, I'm going through screening for two weeks, and then I go into general population. In general population, I would meet the counselor. And he said, uh, do you know so-and-so? I said, yeah, I was with him in the Marine Corps Hospital. He said, I'm his older brother. He said, you took care of him. He said, I'm going to make you the first board man here in Paris Allen, in the prison. At that time, I had a limp, limped all over the prison. Psychiatrists tried to get me to come to him quickly without the limp. Got to take the limp with me, don't I? So they called me the board man. I kept track of prisoners coming in and prisoners going out. Whatever they needed, I had it in the big old doctor's medical ledger. There came a point, uh, uh, there was a young man from Philly. And he uh, 
had uh, been up for two or three days. They found him in a swamp when they brought him in those days. Okay. And he had lived with his grandmother when he came into the service. Anyhow, they uh, kept at him for quite a bit. And the guard uh, seen him and they put him up in the catwalk and they in the catwalk door, cell doors had a little window like that. They told him and said, um, go and lay down, get away from that window. And he told him about three or four times, this this kid's walking around. He did, he's done flip now. He's walking around, walking around. And, uh, guard decides he's going to go up there. And this kid ain't had no sleep in three days. And he goes up there, and I said, I better go up there, too. So I head hopping along up this second catwalk here. And he unlocked that door before I could get there. And when he unlocked that door, that, that boy took that guard out down on the floor. Guard trying to put his handcuffs on him. Handcuffs flew away. I grabbed the handcuffs, and then he cussed him. So I saved his life from being thrown off the tier. Next day, he wanted to give me naked pictures of his wife. That didn't do it for me. But when I was sitting out there in the yard, this is doing it for me right now. I was sitting out smoking a cigarette on the ground. And I looked straight down beyond the prison yard. And here comes God. In a spirit form, but he's coming. And I looked up. I said, I see you, Lord. I heard him say, I'll never leave you. Even when he was at the side of my bed in Aurora, Colorado. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake. His word is true. So I know whose I am. I also know who I am. When I took that church from that pastor, Satan got mad. You see, at this car accident, it was all because Satan wanted it that way. But at the car accident, God was there, death was there, and Satan was there. But there's only one in charge of the whole situation. And once I got my daughter's mother out of the car, I dove back into the car with her and I called out to God. And I said, Lord, give her back to me. Hmm. And so when she died, she got two broken legs and had a subduring hematoma. But always God prepares you. You see, because my fasting had already gone on for three days. And due to the work I was doing in the church. And so when I cried out to God, and I was holding her just like Elijah did to that kid and said, give her back to me. She would cry out with a shrill, a sound that was never heard before in this earth by me. I told you the angels have been in our lives for 
at least two dozen times. God has helped in my situations in life more than a thousand times. She was a year in recovery. I fight with Satan. I look for Satan because I know God has taught me what to look for. I can see him. I can feel his coldness when he walks by or he's in a room. But he's just like Donald Trump. He exerts out what he wants to say, thinking that you don't matter. But he says to me one time, we're in a garage having a back to school bed. Two girls had a demon. And they were both around the same age. One was tall, one was short. And I'm praying over these folks, their parents and everyone. <coughs> The demon says, don't come over here. And I kept strolling over there. The demon's mouth never moved. It was what was in the spirit realm. A guy asked me last year in Omaha, he said, what do you think of Donald Trump? I said, I think he's got a demon. He says, I'm talking about the economy. I said, I don't do economy. I do spirit realm because I know that through the visions that God has given me, I've learned all those things that he has taught me in the last 70 years. Sure, I was in the world for about 12, 15 years. I was like the prodigal son. I've always been like the prodigal son. I wanted to see what the world had for me, just like many of you. You want to see what the world has for you. That's our weakness. God has put the world in front of us so that we not, cannot keep up or search out what he's doing because that doesn't mean nothing to you for what you can have in your hand. You see? God, when you come to him, He'll clean you up. He'll clean you and make you white as snow. But you gotta give up something. And that something is usually the world. The world can't keep you. Only God can keep you. The body says that the flesh and the blood uh, the, 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 the spirit and the flesh are always at war with one another. You want to know why? One's trying to train the other to come its way. And so there's a war going on. And with 100 million people falling away from the church and falling into everything and anything, I was shocked because I knew and know that the Antichrist is coming. I know that the Antichrist is here. I know there are many more Antichrists like the ones we already have in existence. but they are not without power, my sisters and brothers. They have power in the darkness. And if you don't believe that, look at Donald Trump. They said every time we throw something at him, try and get him, it don't stick. He's the Antichrist. Why would anything stick to him? He came with authority. God has sent me to perfect your walk in your ministry in the body of Christ. You say, why you? Who are you? I told you, I'm your brother in Christ, or you can call me nobody. 
But you need to make your choice to come to Jesus. This is, is, is what's interesting about this. I read a couple of weeks back that Satan wanted to be a human being. Do you know why? Because what God has planned for you He challenged God for his kingdom. His kingdom is divided to you. He says you are heirs of God and co-heirs with Jesus Christ, who is the big brother. He would get the greatest inheritance. A short life of uh, 60, 70, 80 years, it's nothing compared to the joy in the new heaven and the new earth that God has for you. So I'm asking the body of Christ that exists right now to reach out to your backslidden brothers and sisters who has been confused of who is God and who is on the Supreme Court. Who is in charge of creation and who is in charge of the laws of the land? He wants you back. And whatever it takes to get you back, that price you will pay. Because he's God all by himself. Why would you choose to get all your riches now when God has eternal life for you and you'll never die? You'll walk on the streets paved with gold. You'll enter into the new Jerusalem with pearls on the gates. Give your life to him. <laughs> he belongs to you and you belong to him. He created you in his image, not in your image. You are his image. And I'm going to ask you today, the church, the spirit-filled church, because if you're not spirit-filled, then there's scales on your eyes and you cannot quite understand what I'm saying. And if you have a problem with the color of my skin and you're wondering why he chose me, because I'm just a poor boy. I want nothing but God. I love all of my children. I love all of my grandchildren. But God has always been first in my life. I could get deeper in this and tell you a lot more between the elect of God and the chosen of God. But he says, I will shorten the time of mankind because of the, not, uh, the elect of God, not because of the chosen. The chosen won't trade you for nothing. The chosen were put here to perfect the church, the apostles, the prophets the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers, they were here to straighten out the church. Now, I said I wasn't going to mess with the Catholics, none at all, and I'm not. But these are who God by his Holy Ghost has put in charge of the church, nobody else. God loves you. And so in completing my thought here for today of what God has sent me for, it's like I told you, I get permission from him to do everything. <laughs> I asked him one day, I said, Lord, 
He's going through a divorce and said, can I move? Down around Dodge City to closer to my Kansas church. This is where he told me to move. And I used to come here and visit elderly sick people, elderly church people. But here's the kicker. I'm going to clean some of this up for you. Martin, Lane, Martin Luther King, he said, I've been to the mountain top in one of his speeches, his final speech. And somewhere along the line, I can remember seeing him in my Uncle Robert's church, but his name wasn't real big back then. And then on my cousin John has pictures of him uh, uh, with my Uncle Robert. Remember I said, God can put you any place he wants to put you. And it takes time. It's taken me 70 years to reach my full capacity of my power and my mind. To lay hands on the sick and they rise up. To lay hands on the dead and they get up. To witness and see a soul 80 years old laying in a bed and going to die within two weeks. And you give them the word of life. I was in this nursing home one day with this, this uh, deacon of mine of one of my churches. And this lady's father, who I had sided with her group in this removal of this church, pastor. It was her father. And when she came into the hospital room with her father and her husband, uh, my deacon was there and I asked them, I said, would you please step out of the room? Uh, sometimes you don't need no hindrance. Sometimes you don't need nobody else's help. With God, you had all the help you need. And so I began to tell this man the story and I began to witness to him and the deacon was standing at the foot of the bed. I was on the side of the bed right beside him. And I carry anointing oil like this. This is good stuff. It's extra version olive oil. What do you use this for, brother? When a demon gets on someone, I anoint their face. And it is the anointing, the Bible says, that breaks the yoke. I remember a lady came from Missouri to the Reach Out Church. She was screaming and screaming and screaming, oh, glory to God. And she came to the altar, and I anointed her with this oil all over her face. And I began to speak Jesus to her. And she would get so quiet. That lady walked away and when the offering came, she stuck a hundred dollar bill in that offer. You know she was satisfied. Then there are demons. And you can tell, just the Jews know about it. Just by looking in their eyes. You can tell. But if you can't see in the spirit, it probably won't help you. You can see and hear in the spirit. What I want to know is why the church is sitting so silent. I'm talking about Christ's church. I'm not talking about nobody else's church. Everybody had their own choices to make. I am a steward in Christ's church. So I'm telling you, I'm asking you to love your brothers, your neighbors as you love God. Because love will win. Hatred, it won't win. Trouble, it won't win. Only love will last. 
It is love that takes you into heaven. The Bible says that our mercies are fresh and new every morning. Every morning is a brand new day. Every morning is a new wake up. Every morning is something that's fresh. You can have a new start. You don't have to commit suicide. You don't have to die in your sin. You choose. Joshua said, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. Whether it was the God of your fathers on the other side of the flood. But you choose. We know we need God. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. I want to see 100 million people come back into the church. I want to see billions of people saved in the time of, of war that is coming. Do you think I enjoy weeping a dozen times a day, every day, and not a tear come from my eye? I'm here to ask you, the body of Christ, to call out to God in a group, an entire body. God is so big, he wants you all right now. He can single out a prayer or can, he can have the entire earth come to him right now. He is God and there is no other God. How do I know that? In 19, uh, I want to say 86, there was a school teacher on a space shuttle. And I was standing with my, putting on my uniform at my house on my way to my tow business. And I had to go to Boulder. But not that day. But I'm standing there and the Lord speaks to me and he says, you see, I've been talking to him since I was five, so I can always talk to him more so now than I'm born again. And so he tells me, I don't know, a few days in 1986 that the space shuttle wasn't coming back. At that time, I told for nine police departments. Had I told anybody that that ship wasn't coming back, they'd have put me in a straitjacket, tied my arms, my flaps of the jacket around me, and said, you stay here for a while. There wasn't no Facebook back right there then. So we have Facebook now. And their final thought when we bring stuff to this live streaming is what is your call to action? My call to action? My call is God's call. Reverse the killing of these billion people that will die in World War III and World War IV in 10 years, 2030. That's the story I told you. That's what I'm here for. I'm not here to ask you for money. I'm not here to ask you for favors. I have favor with God though. Everything else takes care of itself. We open this church up 
in 2018 in a little storefront building. Uh, my wife puts a lot of money into the church. She's the biggest supporter of the church. But I spend money like it's going out of style. So I asked for more money on my cards, this and that, this and that. I get up. They said, uh, we'll notify you in 10 days. And I get up. This is God. I get an email. So you got too much credit. They didn't know my God. The next day, I only asked for a couple cards to increase. All of them increased. You know what the Lord said? <coughs> he says, it's just yours anyway. Now, I don't want you to get overwhelming and going around jacking up your money and stuff. Because it's not about money. It's about God in your life. So uh, there was an angel when uh, we had the car accident and my daughter was in the hospital. Everybody lies in the world. Doesn't mean that the whole body of Christ lies or anybody in the body of Christ lies because they don't, they shouldn't, they had no need. The liars going to hell. I mean, why would you lie in the church? But this hospital, the orthopedic surgeon, fixed her leg on one day. And when he fixed the leg, he, the subdued, the brain doctor did the, 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 the subdued hematoma, but then the orthopedic doctor came and did the leg. But an angel came into her room. <laughs> an angel a real tall man, an angel came into her room and talked to the nurse. This is what the Congress knows the world is. This. I'll get to that in a minute. But the angel told the nurse, said, uh, this other leg is broke. And they're taking her to surgery to fix it. But on the records, it shows that they fix one leg, move her to a clean table, and fix the same leg. I mean, the next leg, which was not true. They didn't fix both legs the same day. They fixed them almost five days apart because they didn't catch it. God's always talking to each and every one of us. But we don't respond you may have something you need to take with you when you go out the door my thing was keys all the time and i would have so many that i take some off and leave them and the spirit would say to me you need to take those with you i say i don't need them you need to learn to listen and hear him because he's coming to you in a still, small voice. Nothing to press you. You just need to learn to listen to him. I, uh, when I was a boy, the Ten Commandments came out. And I was 12 years old. My dad took my sister and I, Cordella, to that movie in 1956. I have, uh, that movie was like four hours long, so they had an intermission, so you can go buy more snacks or something. But I have kept that movie in my heart my whole life because I wanted to be able to go to the mountain. That mountain where 
Moses went and saw the burning bush. I wanted to go there. Now the God that I serve, he said he would give you the desires of your heart. And Moses, he went in search of God. If you search for him, I guarantee you, you'll find him. But in order to receive, when you hear the word of God coming into your hearing, in order to hear it, you must have a place to receive it. God's word in your heart. You're right. You got a freedom of choice. But my thought to you is don't make the wrong choice. I guess I better sign off here pretty quick. There's a war going on. I said a couple years ago that hell has rose to the top of the earth. It's looking to take over. But he can be defeated. And the most awesome weapon that the church has is prayer. The old folks said you, used, you, 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 you need to be prayed up. There's a story of a man in there. They had to cross this 10 foot, 10,000 foot uh, mountain rock to jump to the other side. But if you miss jump, you would fall all the way down. The first fellow, he went and jumped straight over. Straight down he went. The second fellow, he had prayed. at the side of the mountain. And he went and jumped over. And he caught on a root of a tree. And he's just hanging there. But the third fellow, he didn't wait till an incident came to pray. I pray for my children my whole life. I pray for them to be watched over to be kept and i pray myself if i told you you wouldn't believe me if i tell you how much time that i spend in the lord you won't believe me but it's not for you to know you do your thing and let me do mine with the lord now with the lord and the third fellow went over you see, he was prayed up. And he went, and he landed on the other side and pulled the other guy up. You got to help your brother. I could go with this for another hour, but we're probably going to have to do it another time. Because I can tell you about the spaceships that uh, exist in our time today. Elijah called it a fiery chariot. But anything that comes from the outer space into our inner space has fire around it. That's why that one shuttle that went out and lost its towel on it did not get back in. The towel was missing. And if anything is missing when you try and come go out and then come back in, you ain't coming in. One thing right down the street here, uh, be west of me. I lived about six blocks away when I first came here to Nebraska. In 1989, we had come home from church and I was home on a weekend and getting ready to go out the next day. And, and uh, there was a ship. I had a brand new tractor that I was pulling 18 wheeler, making an 18 wheeler out of. And my daughter's was out in her tricycle in the, in the front yard. I was standing there with my my wife then and looking at the tractor. 
but just down here around 40th and Randolph, and I looked up above the tree. I'm always looking up. Why? Because you can't see receive nothing looking down. And I looked down and I saw what I call the ship of Zion. I don't know if you can see this, but I, I had to draw this from, uh, uh, can you see that? There it is. Now you might just see it. That white thing up there. That's the shift that takes the souls of man back, back, back to heaven. And they sleep until God calls them up from under the altar. Now, that was in 1989. In 1990, I went to YouTube, and if you can find it, I've been looking for this video for 25 years now. NASA had a deep space satellite. It was called the Hubble Telescope. And what the Hubble did back in the 80s and 90s, and they've taken it down long since, is it looked back at the Earth. And it could see anything that comes. One thing I find out with a camera, a camera does not miss nothing. The naked eye can look at a screen and not see everything there, but a camera captures it all. And so then I see in this video from the Hubble, two of these ships. That meant they were taking a lot of dead back to heaven. But they were cloaked. You've seen the movies on Star Trek where the thing becomes invisible. That's spirit stuff. And if you don't know spirit stuff, when you see it, you just won't see it. Well, Tina, Jamie, Lisa, very glad to see you today. My nephew, good to see you. For all of you that have come out to visit us, I want to thank you. I'll advertise another time when the word comes from the Lord, and I'll share it with you. For all the preachers I say, see and say, those who are the fivefold ministry, I say, go to the mountain. God would ask, uh, Moses would ask God, he said, and God said, go and tell Pharaoh. I said, let my people go. And Moses said to God, he said, are you going with me? God said, my presence will go with you. Now, let me tell you a little of this. I, we, as creations of God, have most of his attributes. Lion is not an attribute of God. Lion is something Satan sent your way. But here about a year or two ago, when I got to the mountain, I told the Lord, I said, Lord, I don't want to ever leave you. And even when you call me into heaven, I still want to be near you. That's how much you mean to me. And so it, I have left my presence because I have the attributes of God with God on that mountain. And so I can work the works of God right here, right now. But I know my presence is with him. I'm here. But my presence, that attribute that God gave me when he created. Satan has tricked us. God has set the world before us, but he didn't make us choose it. Satan was the enticer there. Being rich right away. Having the world and all that it possessed. <laughs> I love you.
I'll keep you all in prayer. Thanks for coming out, Lisa. I miss you. And I know how much you miss Maddie, but you have gotten a couple new Maddies since then. Tina, one of my baby girls. My nephew, one of my favorite nephews. Cousin John was here. Macy, my little sis, my, my niece, yeah, and her mommy. Thank you all. I love you. I love you. Share, share this video with your friends. Tell them God's coming, but Satan's already here. I want the church to pray. If you pray to God, ask his forgiveness. Ask him to, to forgive you your sins and to love you more and more. But he can't. He gave you all he had. You can love him more and more. But when he gave you that agape love, there is none greater than that. Father, we thank you for this day and all your blessings you bestowed upon us. I thank you for all those who come out to visit and hear from you. Let them say to her, the members of their churches, the bodies of the Christ Jesus family, the bride of Christ, whom we are. We ask, oh God, that you will bless them. Bless their children, their grandchildren, their nieces and nephews, all of their family. Draw, destroy the hatred that is in the world. Destroy the evil that is in the world by the power of your might given and received through prayer. We'll be talking to you. Stay posted. Catch up with us when we're online. God bless you. We love you. Amen.